Okay, so I'm gonna do a three-week series called Three Steps to Victory. And you know we're in a war, and so when you're in a war, do you have a strategic plan for victory? How are you gonna win the war? And so I'm gonna give you three steps. These are the best three steps I can think of to be able to win this spiritual war that we're in. So this will be the next three weeks, all right? Um, the first one, here's the title of this week, is Stop Believing Lies. Stop Believing Lies. I remember praying with a woman at the altar one time. She said, Pastor, you need to pray for me. I said, okay, what do I need to pray about? She said, well, Satan's been lying to me. I said, so you know it's Satan, right? She said, yep. And I said, and you know it's a lie, right? Yep. I said, well, then why do I need to pray? She said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, I think it's because you're believing them. She said, I think you're right. So, but we all do that. We do that. And we're in a warfare. So I want to tell you a few. We're going, you're going to laugh at the first of this message before I get to my three points. Because I want to tell you a lie that I believed growing up that affected me because I believed it. Because if you believe a lie, it gives Satan a foothold. It's the first thing he did with Eve, if you remember. He told her a lie so he could get her to sin. She had to believe the lie before she sinned. So, and I'm, I, we'll look at that scripture. But I believed growing up that I was accident prone. I heard it a lot. I can remember being in the emergency room and hearing one of the nurses say, he's still probably gonna be in the emergency room his whole adult life. Because he's just accident prone. And I'll, I'll, I'm gonna get to some, but so in 2007, um, we went on family vacation to Colorado and we were playing Frisbee golf. So it's not a contact sport. Um, it's not supposed to be. And so uh, I finished the first hole and uh, it, you walk to another like tee box, it's where they have a little mat and you throw the Frisbee and there's a basket and however many times it takes you to get it, that's your score, you know. So, so I'm, I see the, the mat in front of me of the, you know, let's say 50 feet away, and I'm looking for the basket. And so I'm walking like this, you know, looking, and I stepped in about a two-foot hole, and my foot broke, the bone in my foot broke when I stepped in it, and then I fell, and my shoulder hit the rock, and my shoulder socket, my shoulder, uh, yeah, the, I guess the ball, broke the socket, 40% of the socket shattered, uh, it came completely, tore the labrum. I remember the doctor said to me, you tore your labrum 360 degrees. And I remember saying to him, um, there aren't any more degrees, are there? <laughs> and he said, no, you, he said, the only thing, my, my shoulder came out and it would just go in and out because there was no front part of the socket. Uh, I hope, I don't know, some of you are probably thinking, stop, stop, stop talking, stop talking. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just keep going. It's just gonna get grosser and grosser. Um, and so they actually, I'm in Vail, Colorado, and they say, you gotta go back to Dallas to have surgery. Well, they're experts in, in these type of accidents in Vail, and they're saying, you gotta go to this leading shoulder surgeon in the world in Dallas, and one of the doctors in our church knew him and got me in to see him, and so uh, I remember him even telling me, he said, you're going to hear about people say, yes, I had shoulder surgery too. He said, just, just say, smile and say, I'm sorry, but they didn't have shoulder surgery like you because your socket was completely shattered. I had to take bone from another part of your body and rebuild it. And your labrum again was torn 306 degrees. So there was nothing holding your arm on your body except your skin. I told you it's going to get grosser. So, um, and, uh, and then I broke my foot. So when I'm coming back from Dallas, I have a boot on my foot, I have a crutch, only one crutch, because you can't put this arm on a crutch. I have my shoulder, my arm in here, I'm in a lot of pain because I haven't, I'm coming back to have surgery, I haven't had it yet. My shoulder kind of keeps popping in and out, you know. <laughs> this is, this is great. So, but I'm walking along, but everybody, everybody asks you what happened. <laughs> I stepped in a hole. <laughs> and you could see them. It was like, oh, <laughs> idiot. You know, I mean, it was just like no sympathy, and I'm in pain, you know? 
And so I thought, I gotta come up with a better story than this, you know, this isn't good. So the next guy that asked me, he said, what happened? I said, skydiving. <laughs> he was like, oh, wow, really, you know? So, and then I thought, well, I can't say that because it's not true, you know? So let me think of something I can say. I can't say, I, and I thought, well, maybe I can say I fell off a mountain. But I didn't really fall off, I fell on, you know, the mountain. So then I thought, oh, I'll, you know what? I can say I stepped in a ravine. You know, that sounds better. I was on a mountain in Colorado, and I fell in a ravine. I fell in a ravine. Next lady comes up, what happened? I was on a mountain in Colorado, and I fell in a ravine. I just wasn't expecting her to question me. She said, how deep? <laughs> two, two feet. And then it was the same thing. Oh, idiot. You know, I mean, it, you know, so. So I've had lots of accidents growing up. My first accident when I was three years old, I, I did, that was a ravine, I think six to eight feet deep, uh, trying to do a tricycle too fast, fell uh, face first. My two front teeth went through my bottom lip and then lodged in my bottom lip. Had my first surgery when I was three years old. And, and then a uh, surgery, I don't know whether it was a year later or what, to remove the scar tissue, yeah. So my dad's going like this. Thanks, Dad, for the painful memory. So anyway, but my lip was just really big, and they removed scar tissue. But I remember thinking how big my bottom lip was growing up. I don't know if you ever thought that you looked different and you were weird. You were the freak in class, but, you know. And then people would emphasize it like, you know, you have a big bottom lip, you know. And I, I want to say, you know, you have a big bottom. You know, I, 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 I don't know. No. <laughs> it's, I, did. Well, I tried not to, but anyway. Um, this is BC, this is before Christ, so you can't judge me. <laughs> then when I was eight, I was hit by a car and, and, and put my arm up like this when I hit the pavement and it hit my top lip. <laughs> <laughs> and skin all, it took all the skin off my arm and so my top lip swelled up. Then I, I remember when I went to join the band, when I walked in, the band director said, wow, you'd be great for a trombone, look at those big lips. <laughs> Again, you know, I want to say, you'd be great for a tuba. Look at those big hips. You know, I, you, know, I just, you know, why are you doing this to me? Why are you saying all these things? So it just kept going right after we started the church. Uh, Elaine and I and Debbie were riding around the block on our bicycles. Elaine says, race you home. So we're racing, going very fast. And all of a sudden, I, we don't know, I don't know to this day what happened, but it's like the front wheel just went sideways. And I had the pavement, was knocked unconscious. Uh, ambulance had to come, but here's something amazing. Steve Doolin, who's one of our elders that you know, was an elder at another church at that time. They were in their elders meeting, and they were in worship. And the pastor of the church that I was good friends with said, guys, I just had a vision of Pastor Robert riding a bike, and a lion came out of the woods and mauled him. And he said, I think we need to pray for his safety. And then Debbie texted Melody, Steve's wife, because they're good friends of ours, and said, Robert's on the way to the emergency room. He just had a bicycle accident. So it's just amazing. And so um, I'm, I'm not saying that all accidents are caused by the, the enemy, but I'm saying that we ought to think about it because I believe these things were normal. Are y'all, uh, when, uh, when about four years after we started church, Elaine and I were in a motorcycle wreck. And she had to be care flighted and I broke six ribs, which is very painful, on the right side, uh, and both of our helmets uh, cracked. And the uh, uh, medical personnel told us, if, if you hit the pavement hard enough for a helmet to break, that means it would have killed you without the helmet. And uh, so you better be grateful you had helmets on. Now listen to this, Lelaine was 13 at the time. Just a few weeks later, we pull up at a red light, there's a guy uh, on a big Harley, tattoos, um, you know, uh, the tor typical motorcycle gang looking type guy. And, you know, I'm not looking, you know, and all of a sudden my daughter's in the back seat, she rolls one down and I hear her say, sir, sir, excuse me, sir. I'm thinking, what, what are you doing? You know, sugar. And this guy, you know, looks over and she's, uh, he's always hardly, you know, and she says, excuse me, sir. I just want to tell you that my dad and I were just in a motorcycle wreck. And our helmets cracked, and if we hadn't had our helmets on, they said we would have died. 
And she said, I'm sure you're a, a very good motorcycle rider. I'm thinking, I'm sure he's a pretty good hell's angel too. Uh, <clears throat> but she, she said, and I just felt like I should tell you that you might want to wear a helmet because of safety, you know? And this, this guy, let's say, says, he said, young lady, you're the third person this week to tell me this. So he said, I think God's trying to talk to me. He said, thank you, you know, to my little daughter, you know. So, so anyway, I've had these accidents just almost my whole life until I discovered, you know, this. But uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you one more um, because it's funny again. Uh, Debbie and I were having a pillow fight one time. You know, you just, you know how you just do that. And Josh was there and he was only five. So I was only, James was either, I think just, just a baby at that, yeah, just a baby at that time. And uh, so anyway, after the pillow fight, I turn around, I'm walking out of the room, Debbie's on one, the other side of the room, and I turn around and I just decide that I'm gonna just do a karate kick. <laughs> just to kind of, you know, you know, and just jump up in the air and it's gonna look exactly like Chuck Norris does it, you know, and, and Josh is there and she's on the other side of the room, so I'm not even close to her, but I just jump up in the air, yeah! perfectly execute it, you know, and land on my left ankle, it turns and breaks. But the funny part is the next day in chapel, Josh goes to, went to a Christian school. He's in kindergarten. This is a K through 12 school. And uh, I'm the associate pastor at the church where the school is. So everybody knows Pastor Robert. And uh, the uh, principal said, anyone have a prayer request? And little Joshy, you know, raises his hand and says, yes, please pray for my father. You're Pastor Robert, when you pray for Pastor Robert? Yes, he and my mother were fighting. He tried to karate kick her and she broke his leg. <laughs> so of course, when I go to pick up you know, Josh after school and have a cast on my ankle, then everyone's wanting to know the story. But, uh, you know, a while back I was summer and this lady came up to me that watches me on TV and she said, uh, oh, I, I just love you, I love your message and all. And she says, I love it when you tell funny stories about your life. She says, you know, your, your whole life is just one big joke. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, so. In 2007, when I, when I uh, you know, broke my shoulder and all that, and I'm lying around, getting recovering, and then, you know, all this, the therapy you gotta go through, I remember just saying, Lord, Lord, I've had so many accidents. Um, it, it, have I opened a door to the enemy? And the Lord, I felt like he went just like this. Yep. I mean, he, he didn't even have to think about it, you know? <laughs> he didn't even have to go like, hmm, how do we think about that, you know? He said, yep. And I said, what? He said, you believed a lie. Do you, do you know how to know if you believe a lie? If it doesn't surprise you. In other words, I've had people say to me, uh, Pastor, we need you to pray. Um, my, my husband's just been diagnosed with cancer, but it didn't really surprise us because you know his daddy had cancer and his granddaddy had cancer. Or, you know, my husband has heart disease, but it doesn't surprise us because his daddy died of a heart attack and his granddaddy died of a heart attack. See, when it doesn't surprise you, you believe the lie. See, you've forgotten that you've been adopted into a new family. And so Satan tells you this is normal. It's not normal for kingdom children. So we have to understand that. So you've got Genesis 3. Uh, I told you, I'll just read it to you. Verse Satan lying to Eve. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but just the chapter four, here's what God actually said. You shall eat of every tree of the garden, except the tree which is in the midst of the garden. So God says it positively, Satan says it negatively. And then in a moment, you're going to see Satan outright lie. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You see the lie? God said, you will surely die. Satan says, you will not surely die. Please hear me. The first step to sin 
is believing a lie. You need to think about what lie have I believed. I can remember when I began learning about freedom ministry and things like that, I remember these things about being accident prone and I thought, well, I've broken those words. But here's, here's what the Lord said to me. He said, yeah, but you still believe them. In your heart, you believe you're accident prone. You believe it's normal for you to have accidents. And I need you to stop believing that. So let me tell you three ways that we can open the door to the enemy by believing a lie, all right? Here's number one, the sins that we continue. The sins that we continue. In other words, if you're gonna persist in a sin that you know is a sin, and you know it is, and you, have, you can do something about it, and all of you can, as all of us can as believers, you're opening the door to the enemy. And let me just take one that all of us can relate to, and that's unforgiveness. This is what Paul said about unforgiveness, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For indeed, I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Now watch this. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So in other words, if you hold on to unforgiveness, Satan's coming in. He, 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 it, he's saying, lest Satan take advantage of us. He's, he, in other words, he has an open door. I can remember one time, uh, just lying awake at night, uh, replaying it over and over in my mind, what someone had said, and just, you know, what I'm going to say next time I see that person, you know. And by the way, if you rehearse something in your mind, you haven't forgiven because forgive means to release. Amen. It means you release that person. And Satan convinces us, here's what he convinces us, if you release them though, then, then nothing, nothing's gonna happen to them. Well, first of all, it's not your responsibility. <laughs> it's God's responsibility. And second of all, if you don't release them, something's gonna happen to you. Amen. That's what you need to know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just replaying it over and over in my mind, and all of a sudden, it was just like the Lord said to me, Stop it. I mean, I, don't, I felt like he was almost trying to say, I'm trying to get some sleep, you know, stop it. It's two in the morning, stop it. And I said to him, but Lord, he was wrong. And the Lord said to me, of course he was wrong. That's why you forgive him. You don't forgive people who are right. <laughs> and just think about that. We, we, we have every reason to not forgive someone. But if you don't forgive them, there's a door open. Now, we have what we call freedom here at Gateway, where we help people. Um, we've changed everything up, gone through everything, because when we started it, we did our best, and now down the road, we say we can make it better. So now there's the growth track. We want every person to go through the growth track. We've had, four, we've had several, many go through it, but 4,000 people who've gone through it, who went through Catch the Vision before, and they say, man, it's totally different than what it was when we went through it before. So even if you went through Catch the Vision, I really want you to go through growth track. And then after growth track is next steps and then freedom. And we've set up next steps and freedom uh, and then stewardship. And we set that up where you can do it in a group, uh, you can do it in a class, or you can do it online. But you wanna go through the growth, the growth track first, all right? But then next steps and then freedom. And we've completely redone freedom. We've completely redone it. And here are the, there are only two groups of people that I want to go through freedom, okay? Those that have never gone through it, and those that have already gone through it. <laughs> Just those two though, okay? No other groups, okay? And, and let me tell you a second reason I want people who've already gone through it. One is because we realized uh, that we, we needed to go through it and change some things, and we changed those things. But secondly, let me, I wanna say something very strongly here. The way the enemy will hit you once you go through freedom ministry, is with pride. I've seen it thousands of times. And I am an expert in this area. I've, I've seen it over and over and over. Because once you people go through freedom ministry, they get free of a lot of things, and they feel like, I know something that other people don't know. 
I just met with our Freedom Ministry team from all of our campuses, all the, all, all the staff, and I warned them about this. I said, guys, you teach freedom to other people, but you better keep getting free yourselves. And you better quit looking down at any, don't, 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 don't look down at someone else because immediately Satan's got you. As soon as you think that you're smarter than someone or you're freer than someone, you're in bondage. If you actually think you're freer than others, you're in bondage. Satan's got you. I mean, Satan is the most cunning. <laughs> He's brilliant. As soon as you learn something new, he tells you how good you are. That's how good he is. So, first of all, sins that we continue. Any sin that you continue can be an open door to the enemy. Here's the second way that we open the door to the enemy through believing a lie. The words that we speak. The words that we speak. I'm accident prone. Just normal. Words that we speak. Let me show you. It's in Scripture and it's very clear. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Do you see that scripture? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's the Bible. Now, let me say this. Some take this to an extreme and say, you, we have creative ability with our tongues. Okay, you don't. You don't. Let me tell you what this means. This means that you can agree with the one who has creative power, or you can agree with the one who has destructive power. That's what this means. In other words, you can agree with life or you can agree with death. You can agree with God or you can agree with the devil. But you don't have creative power. I tried. I said, let there be a red Corvette in the driveway. There was no red Corvette in the driveway. <laughs> but God has creative power and he has life. So you agree with God's word over your life with your mouth or you agree with Satan's words over your life. And look at this verse, Proverbs 6, 2. You are snared by the words of your mouth. A snare would be like a trap, like a small animal in a trap. You're trapped. You're in bondage. Let's say it that way. You're in bondage by the words of your own mouth. And then I want to show you Numbers 30. This is a scripture. Some of you might not have even ever even seen this scripture. But I want to show you how words can bind and how words can be broken. And that's the good news. They can be broken. But they can bind. Watch. Numbers 30 verse 1. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself, bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Look at that. He shall do what proceed comes out of his mouth. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord, and I'll tell you why in a moment he's using a man and a woman. It's not, it may not be what you think. I'll tell you why in a moment. If a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement, now here's the clarification, you know, while in her father's house in her youth. In other words, he's simply speaking of someone who's under another person's authority, okay? And that, that's why this is important. And her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself. I told you words can bind you. She has bound herself. And her father holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand, and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows nor her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand. And the Lord, the Lord, will release her because her father overruled her. You, you see how simple it says? In other words, if someone who has a spiritual authority hears you say something foolish with your mouth, that person with spiritual authority can break those words. That's what this is saying. So you can, I just read you the verse. You can bind yourself with your words and words can be broken. There it is right there in the Bible. Think about all the things that are said, the curses that are spoken. And children hear them. Like I heard, I was accident prone. I heard I was going to be in the emergency room my whole life. I believed those things. I believed them. Uh, this lady told me one time after I shared a, a talking about something like this and a message on freedom. I did a whole series on it. Um, but I talked about this. And she said, I was in the grocery store one time. My daughter was about three years old. And the lady behind me said, your daughter is so beautiful. And I said, well, thank you. And then this is what the lady said. She said, she is so sweet. And then she said, but now when she gets to be a teenager, she's going to break your heart. 
Just like that. And this lady in our church told me, she said, because I'd heard your teaching about words that you did, when I got in the car, I broke those words over my daughter. I broke them. I didn't let them stand. In the same way, you'll hear your kids say things, you can break those words. For instance, you ever heard a child will say this, I'm just stupid. You say, you're not stupid, you have the mind of Christ. Or they say, I just can't get math. You say, you, you, you can't, I overrule that in Jesus' name. And you just tell them, you belong to Gateway, and Pastor Robert is a genius at math, so you're going to be a genius at math too. So just, just, huh. you're a genius. You're smart. We need to overrule things that are spoken. I'm telling you, the words that you speak can keep you in bondage. It's clear in Scripture because it means you believe it. Out of the abundance of the heart, you want to finish the verse? The mouth speaks. He said, I don't understand how just saying something, because it's in your heart. You know how it got in your heart? Because you believe the lie. But this book is truth. So you can speak the truth, and you can break the lie. So the words that we speak, and here's number three, the thoughts that we think. The thoughts that we think. You say, I don't, I don't see how that can affect. Well, watch. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think it, if you think you're accident prone, you're accident prone. It's amazing. It is amazing what we believe as truth becomes truth in our lives. That's why we need to say in the Word. Jesus said this in John 8, 32. It's a real famous scripture. You probably know it. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, here's a really simple question. You're going to love this. If the truth sets you free, then what does the lie do? <laughs> that was good, by the way. <laughs> As the young people say, that was tweetable. <laughs> that was good. If the truth sets you free, then what does a lie do? Hold you in bondage. i got to say that again because I want you all to get this. <laughs> Jesus said it. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So if truth sets you free, what do lies do? They hold you in bondage. It's all through Scripture. Numbers 13. This is when the children of Israel went to spy out the land. Twelve spies, ten came back with a bad report, two came back with a good report. Here, the, and there's Joshua and Caleb. Here are the ten that gave the bad report. Numbers 13, verse 32. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we, which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw, by the way, all of them were, and the land, the land didn't devour anybody. Uh, but all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like, watch how important this is. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Now, remember, everything in the Old Testament happened to them naturally, but it represents something spiritual to us. So these are the, that's the enemy, okay? So listen, we were like grasshoppers in our minds, in our thoughts, in our hearts. And so we were like grasshoppers in the enemy's heart, in the enemy's thoughts then. Because we saw ourselves as grasshoppers the enemy saw us as grasshoppers. See, every lie contains a little bit of truth. There were giants in the land. That's true. There were giants. The kingdom truth is our God loves to kill giants. <laughs> he has no problem with giants. He can kill them with a boar and a slingshot. Giants are not a problem for him. Let me tell you something else that's so good about Satan lying. He fabricates evidence to back up his lies. He fabricates evidence to back up his lies. His lies. Do you, you remember when Joseph's brothers threw him in a pit? They took his coat, they tore it into pieces, 
They put animal's blood on it. They brought it back to their father. Listen to what they said. Is this your son's coat? Jacob then said, my son has been torn to pieces by wild animals. They didn't say that. He said it. You know why? Fabricated evidence. Satan will fabricate evidence. And, be, and you'll say, well, I know this is true, though, because this, this, and this has happened. It doesn't matter what's happened in your life. Listen to me. It matters what this book says. It matters what the truth says. So in, in 2007, when I fell and God started showing me I believed the lie, uh, I was recuperating. Pastor Jack Hayford called me and said, how you doing? I've been praying for you. I said, I'm doing well. I said, can I tell you something that I think God's showed me through this process? I said, he said, yeah. I said, I, I think I believed a lie and opened the door to the enemy because I've heard all my life I'm accident prone. Uh, I've had lots of accidents. I can't, you know, I can't even tell you. Matter of fact, I, at that time in 2007, I counted, I had already, I'd broken 16 bones. 16. That someone was asking me a while back that hurt their wrist or something. I don't know if it's broken or not. I said, it's not broken. They were like, you know, you're not a doctor. I said, no, I'm not a doctor. But I, I, you'd be screaming if it was broken. Because <laughs> I know what broken bones feel like. That, that it's not the normal. So you're not standing there and we're like that if it's broken, believe me. So, um, but I've broken all these bones. So I'm telling Dr. Jack Hayford about it. And I said, I, I, I feel like I believed a lie. And God showed me that. And he gets quiet on the other end of the phone. And he said, God just spoke to me. And he said, I want to speak something over you prophetically. Because none of Messiah's bones, you know, that's Messiah would be the Hebrew word for Jesus, obviously. None, not well, Yeshua would be for Jesus Christ, Messiah would be for Christ. Because none, this is what Jack said, because none of Messiah's bones were broken. And because you are a part of the body of Messiah, I declare no more broken bones. That was in 2007. This is 2019. I've not broken a bone since that time. Not one. You want to get to victory? Number one, stop believing lies. I'll tell you next week what number two is. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. I'd like for you to just ask the Holy Spirit. We ask the Holy Spirit every week, what are you saying to me? I'd like for you to ask him specifically all this week, are there some lies about myself that I have believed? All right, so today's message is called Stay in the Word. We're talking about three steps to victory, and last week, stop believing lies. This one is Stay in the Word. Now, I want you to think about um, why would a person a believer ever walk away from the Father? Because we've all done it. Uh, maybe it was a few years for some of you. Maybe it was a few months. Maybe a few weeks. Maybe a few days. Maybe a few minutes. So don't be judgmental of someone who's walked away for a few years and you say, well, I've never done that. Well, you've done it for a few minutes. I guarantee you. All of us have. And the reason that we do it uh, I'm going to get into that reason very deeply in the message, but it's because we follow what we think and what we want and what we feel. And so we're going to talk about that, and some of you might pick up on, I just described the soul. What we think, mind, what we want, will, and what we feel, emotions. So we're following what our own soul wants, not what the Spirit of God is telling us. So we'll get into that, all right? But why would anyone ever walk away from the Father? So I thought about this afternoon when I was thinking about this. Um, when Elaine, my daughter, was three years old, Josh and James were in school, so Debbie and I and Elaine went to the mall. And we were in like Nordstrom's, and Debbie said, I'm going to go try these clothes on. You watch Elaine. And I said, okay. And then she said to me, look at me. 
because I remember when she was saying it, I was looking, is, does Nordstrom's have a sporting goods section, you know? They don't, by the way. But anyway, so I'm, I'm wondering where the sporting goods store is in the mall. And so um, she says, look at me. You know how Elaine is, and I know how you are. You watch Elaine. Now, Elaine is standing right beside me. I said, I got this. I said, we've already had two kids, and I haven't lost them that much. <laughs> so I've got this. Lane's standing right here. Debbie walks into the dressing room. I watch her. The door shuts. I turn around and say, now, Elaine, 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 Elaine. She's gone. That fast. Well, we weren't far from the entrance, so I thought, well, if I get to the entrance to the mall, because I could find her probably in the store, but if she gets into the mall, you know, I may never find her. So I, I go to the entrance. I look to the left. I don't see her. I look to the right. She's about 100 feet from me, and she's walking like this, just going down the mall. And so I take off after these three precious ladies sitting on a bench, see this three-year-old, no parent, and they realize what's happened, that the wife told the husband to watch her. <laughs> and so they said to her, wait, hey, 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 sugar, where are you going? She went like this. She said, I go shopping. You know, so they said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait just a minute. Tell us what you're going to go shopping for. You know, they stopped her. So then I came up, and then they gave me the look. <laughs> you know, like your gender isn't good for hardly anything, you know, but I've gotten that look a lot from ladies. But anyway, so <laughs> I was actually just thinking about the look I got from your wife one time, Thomas. Um, uh, I, I don't know if y'all know this, but I'm just going to, but Debbie dresses me. <laughs> Debbie puts my clothes out for me, you know, so, yeah, because I'm colorblind. And when I used to travel and preach and she couldn't go, she actually numbered my clothes. And like coats were like A, B, C, D, you know, pants, one, two, three, four. People used to ask me, what, oh, that's beautiful. What is that? I'd say B4. Kind of like bingo, you know, it's BB4. And so, anyway, so, so um, where was I here? I just thought I'd tell you that. So, Debbie, Elaine, okay. So, they give me this look, and so I, I, get, I get Elaine, and um, I'm trying to get back to the store before Debbie gets out of the dressing room, you know? And so we started heading back, but as I turned around and looked, there's Debbie standing at the entrance, uh, giving me the look, you know? So... But why did my daughter walk away? She wasn't rebellious. She was just following what she was thinking. I go shopping, what she felt and what she wanted. Are you following me? Okay, listen, that's exactly what the Bible says about babies in Christ. They follow their soul and we have to learn to follow our spirit. Are you following me? So the reason we do is because we're three parts. I know that doesn't sound like that's an amazing revelation, but we're three parts. Spirit, soul, and bottom, body. We are a trichotomy, not a dichotomy. There are just a few that say we're a dichotomy. We only have two parts, but it's, it's not true. Biblically, it's very easy to show we're three parts. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when he was on this earth, his body went in the tomb, Scripture says you will not leave his soul in Hades, or Sheol says the Old Testament, New Testament, Hades, which is the place of the waiting of the dead. So his soul during those three days went to Hades, and then on the cross he said, into, into thy hands I commit my spirit. See the, see the three? Body, soul, and spirit. Uh, Genesis 2, when God created man, you'll see all three in one verse. Verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He didn't form his soul or spirit of the dust of the ground. He formed his body. From dust your body came, from to dust your body will return. He, so that's his body. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. This is the word for spirit. Spirit. So there he became a spirit. And he man became a living soul. See what I'm saying? So spirit, soul, and body. Everyone get that? Are you with me? You got to be with me on this one because we're going to go very deep. Is everyone with me? Okay. 
Now, God created our spirits to relate to him. He created our souls to relate to him and his creation. His creation, including other human beings as well, plants, animals, trees, all the things, you know, that we relate to his creation. We can climb a mountain, we can swim in the ocean, and he created our bodies to relate to his creation. And that's where I was, that's where I was going with, we can swim in the ocean, climb a mountain, something like that. So our bodies he created to relate to his creation. Our spirits he created to relate to him. Our souls he created to relate to him and his creation. Here's the problem. When Adam and Eve died, when they sinned, pardon me, when they sinned, their spirits died. If you remember, God said, if you eat that, you will die. Their bodies didn't die. Now death set in, and eventually they died, but their bodies didn't die immediately. Their souls didn't die because he heard, Adam said, I heard you walking in the garden, and I was afraid. That's an emotion. And so I made a choice in my will to hide because I, I thought that would be the best thing to do. See what I'm saying? His mind, will, and emotions were still working. But his spirit died. Because God said, you eat that, you'll die. What died? Their spirits died. Ephesians 2 says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And he made us alive when we came to Christ. Jesus said, we quote this verse, but we kind of miss the first part. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It's great to talk about abundant life. But listen to what he actually said. I've come that you might have life. You're not even alive without me. You're existing, but you're not alive. I came that you might have life. Are y'all following me? So our spirits died. So the problem is that Adam and Eve learned to relate to God only, without their spirits, only by what they could reason in their own minds, what they wanted, and what they felt was best. Mind, will, and emotions. Let me put this up here. Mind is what we think. Will, what we desire. Emotions, what we feel. Mind, what we think. Emo uh, will, what we desire or want. And emotions, what we feel. Now listen to me. This is why it is so, this is why Christians have problems. Because we get into a situation and we make a decision based on what we think, what we want, and what we feel. And I'm going to say something very strongly to you. I don't care what you think, what you want, or what you feel. I care what God wants, what God says, what God thinks, and what God feels, and what God wants. And that's the only way to make the right decision is to find out what the Word says about what you want to decide. So you, when you make a soulish decision, it's selfish. Until your soul matures. You need to make a spiritual decision. So, here's the problem. Here's point number one. The soul is selfish. The soul is selfish. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the soul means self. Soulish, selfish. The soul is selfish. And we came into this world with a dead spirit. So for years, we related to God. And think about this, with our minds, only our minds. Now, we still can use our minds, but remember, we, we need to renew our minds. We need to have the mind of Christ. We need to convert our souls, the Bible says, which again, your mind will and emotions. But we come in... Thinking, think about how many people, when they're trying to figure out God and they're not saved yet, they have a dead spirit, how off they can get all these different religious sects, how screwed up they can get because they're only relating to God by what their own intellect can figure out. Their own minds. So, I'm going to just, God, now we're talking about the soul is selfish, but we got mind, will, and emotions. I don't have time to cover the other two, but I'm just going to do a little study on mind. Let me tell you a little bit about your mind, and then I'm going to tell you a spiritual truth that's going to help you a lot. So, 
your mind is the best computer possible on this earth today. And they will never, never, ever invent a computer better than the human mind. As when you talk to scientists who actually understand the mind, they'll clarify. They'll, they'll, they will back up what I'm saying. Your mind's unbelievable. Your mind knows everything that you've ever seen, heard, or experienced. And it's categorized it. Everything. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, where is it? <laughs> because I can't remember it. Okay. It's in your subconscious. That's where it is. And when you're trying to remember it, you're trying to bring it to your conscious mind. For instance, you'll say, oh, what was that guy, that, the, remember the plumber, I need to get the, that plumber back, came to our house, remember uh, you told me to your spouse, remember his name was John, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to get him, and I was just trying to remember, but I can't remember his last name, I can't, I don't, I don't remember the name of the company. Do you remember the name of the company? And, uh, you know, remember he had two kids. Remember he said one was at Baylor and one was at TCU. And you, you remember, I, you know, you know, plumbers can afford expensive colleges. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, I can't remember. I can't, I just don't remember, you know. And, and then, and, and your wife says, no, I don't remember either. Okay, let me tell you though, it will come from your subconscious to your conscious normally right before you go to sleep. When you relax, all of a sudden you say, all-star plumbing, you know, you got it. <laughs> right? All right? Okay. So that's what it is. We say it's on the tip of our tongue. No, it's in our subconscious. Your mind categorizes and remembers everything. When you walk in a room, your mind says, have I ever seen, heard, or experienced anything like this before? And your mind immediately says yes. You've experienced 493 rooms similar to this room. You've seen 71 rooms that were very similar to this room. And you've seen four rooms that were almost identical. That's how we get what we call deja vu. We think, I've been here before. And then if you're, if you're lost and really out there, you think, I've been here in a former life. You hadn't been there in a former life. It's just your mind thinks that. You follow me? This is how you can meet someone and not like them immediately. You be in a restaurant with your wife and you're walking out and she says, oh honey, wait, wait, this is Susie. You remember Susie? I work out with Susie. I told you about Susie and of course you have, you, the answer man is, oh yes, I remember. You don't have a clue. <laughs> but you just say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember Susie. And Susie says, this is my husband, Bill. You say, hi Bill, how are you? You walk out of the restaurant, you get in the car, and you say to your wife, I don't like that guy. <laughs> and she said, well, you just met him. You don't even know him. Oh, yeah, I know him. I know his type. <laughs> because your mind said, have I ever met anyone like this? Yes, you've met 364 people who are like this guy. Uh, you've met who are similar. You've met 47 people who are very similar. And you met three who are almost identical, and one of them pulled your shorts down in gym class in seventh grade. <laughs> and your wife said, again, said, you don't know him. Oh, I've got a whole file on him. <laughs> I know exactly what he's like. Are, are y'all following me? Yeah. That, that's how brilliant it is. Okay, so you say, so why are you telling me this? Here's why. Because when you come against, up against a problem that causes you stress or tension, your mind says, have I ever experienced this before? And your mind tells you how to respond. This is called in the Bible a stronghold. This is how stronghold works. If you, if you have a stronghold, you might not want to admit it, but just you don't have to do it out loud, but just to yourself, a stronghold of lust or a stronghold of anger, or a stronghold of pride, or insecurity, or inferiority, or if you have some addiction. This is exactly how addiction works. Exactly. Scientists will agree with this, they just don't make, unless they're Christian, they don't understand the spiritual part. This is what happens. You come in, you see an experience that is similar to something you've had before, and your mind says, I need a drink. I need a drink to handle this, because this. I've, every time I've come to this situation before, I've had to have a drink. Are you following me? 
So that's why we read, the, listen, remember the title of the message, Stay in the Word. Because what happens is, after a while, your mind says, have I ever experienced anything like this before? And your mind says, yes, I have. And then your mind will say to you, because you're renewing your mind, your mind says, I need to get in the Word. I need to call someone for prayer. See, you totally begin to change the way you deal with these strong. Are y'all, are y'all following me? This is really good. If you don't know good preaching, you do, I'm just helping you. <laughs> this is the way a stronghold works. This, I'm, the three easy steps to victory. Number one, stop believing lies. Here's what else I can say on stay in the Word. Start believing the truth. Start believing what God says about you, not what someone else says about you, not what Satan says. So number one, the soul is selfish. Here's number two. The soul must submit to the Spirit. The soul must submit to the Spirit. Now, Romans 9, remember everything in the Old Testament happened in the natural, but it's a spiritual truth to us in the New. And many times... In the New Testament, they'll quote an Old Testament scripture and they'll tell us the spiritual truth. And Romans 9 is telling us one of the spiritual truths in this Old Testament scripture. Here it is. Romans 9 verse 12 says, It was said to her, this is speaking to Rebecca, about Jacob and Esau that were in her womb, the older shall serve the younger. This, I could have given you several examples of this. This is actually a scriptural principle. The older shall serve the younger. Now, for those of you who are the, the older sibling, uh, this is not a natural principle, all right? Don't, and for those of you who are younger, don't say, yep, I knew he should be serving me. Okay, this has nothing to do with natural, okay, brothers and sisters, siblings. This is a spiritual principle. And what does it mean? Let me tell you, there, there are about four applications of it spiritually, but let me tell you one of them. The soul and the spirit. Okay, when you were conceived in your mother's womb, your soul came alive. And it is at conception it's not at birth. Life does begin at conception. That's very clear in Scripture. You, you, try to, you try to take that baby out of his mother's womb one minute, that's a baby. One minute before he's born, that's still a baby. That's not a giraffe. It's not a blob. It's not goo. It's a baby. It is a baby. It's a human life. It is amazing to me that people will save a beached whale and not a baby. That's amazing. The head of one of the large animal rights movements a while back, she was asked, uh, if there was a baby and a dog drowning, which one would you save? She said, that's a tough one. <laughs> it's a public statement, you can see it. That's a tough one. No, it's not a tough one, lady. You save the baby. You save human life. So anyway, that's just, that was just a side note. That was free. Um, but your soul comes alive at conception. Your mind, your will, and your emotions, all right? And then you're born, you go through life, and then, for me, I got saved at 19. Now, now when you're born, remember, you're born with a dead spirit. Your spirit's dead in trespasses and sins. That's the Bible. Your spirit's dead. But you come to Christ, your spirit is made alive. So I got saved at 19. I was almost 20. So for 20 years, I lived with my soul in charge. I did what I thought was best. I did what I wanted to do, kind of like Elaine at three. She wanted, she wanted to go shopping, so she went, see? And I did what I felt was best for me. But when I was almost 20, my spirit came alive. And my spirit said to my soul, I'm in charge now. And my soul, being the kind and gracious and humble person that he is, said, sure. Or do you think that's what happened? No, my soul said, not without a fight. And my soul's been fighting ever since. But the more I get in this word, receive the engrafted word of God, James says, which is able to save. And that word save is to make whole your souls. There's all these scriptures about converting your souls. It doesn't mean, it's not talking about your eternal salvation. It's talking about Converting, changing, changing your soul, letting your soul grow up. So important for us to understand this. My soul, uh, my spirit will say, you need to lay down your life for your wife and you need to turn the other cheek. My soul says, uh, you need to give her a piece of your mind and let her know who's boss. 
uh, which I found out uh, she is. But anyway, I, that's, not, that's not the point. So let me ask you just one little application of this. Are, with what you watch and what you read, are you feeding your soul or your spirit? It is amazing how much we read on the internet and how little we read the Bible. And then you wonder why you don't have strength when you get tempted. Because if, if your soul and spirit were dogs, and they're obviously not, I'm trying to use an example. If your soul and spirit were dogs, you've got a great Dane sometimes fighting it out with a chihuahua. Your soul and your spirit, when it should be the other way around because you should have been feeding one and starving the other one. So again, I told you there's a lot of good stuff. This is just practical to you. Okay, David talked to his soul. Remember the word soul means self. So he talked to himself. He wasn't crazy. He talked to himself. He told his soul to not be discouraged. He told his soul to bless God. He told his soul to be quiet. Let me read you one of them. Psalm 131, verse 2. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Okay. So I, he says, I told my soul to calm down and be quiet. But my soul is like a weaned child, a weaned child. But how do you wean a child? Well, you take him off of milk and you put him on solid food, right? Watch again, the Bible is so perfect. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes or babies in Christ. I've had to feed you with milk and not solid food. Uh, Hebrews 5, verse 12. For though by now, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. He goes on to talk about those who need milk instead of solid food. They're not, they're not mature. You've you got to grow up. You've got you to take your soul off of milk, get your, your soul on solid food. Can I just say something right now? It is important where you go to church. It's important that whoever's preaching to you is preaching the Bible and not good opinions. Good opinions don't help. Good news helps. What the Bible says is what helps you. You want to be fed the Word of God. That's what helps you. Okay? So, uh, now, why does a child, you ever thought about this? He says it's like a weaned child. What does a child do? Let's say that. What does a child do when you try to wean the child? Cries and throws a fit, right? What do you think your soul does? <laughs> Cries and throws a fit. But why? You ever thought about that? Why does a child cry and throw a fit when you're trying to wean the child? And I'm going to tell you why. Actually, maybe you never thought of it. Because he thinks you're trying to kill him. You're taking away the only food source he's ever known. Right? He doesn't know there's another food source. So he thinks you're trying to kill him. Okay, listen to me though. In the case of the soul, he's right. You are trying to kill him. Let me read it to you. Here's point three, and then I'll read you the scripture. Point three, the soul must die. And I'll show you the scriptures in a minute. But here's what I mean by this. Your selfish thoughts, your selfish desires and your selfish emotions, feelings, need to die. They need to die. You need to die to self. That's the only way you're going to have victory. You have to die to self. What, what you think and what you feel and what you want doesn't matter. To you, my dad used to use the expression, that doesn't matter a hill of beans. <laughs> have you ever heard that? Doesn't matter, a hill of beans. I remember thinking, a hill of beans. <laughs> don't, don't matter. I bet they matter to the guy who planted them. 
But anyway, I, I, I just don't understand that expression, but I'm sure there's some, something in the back of it. I'll Google it, all right? All right. But here's what I want to show you about how the Bible plays the part in this. I'm going to read you a very famous scripture that everybody knows, but hardly anybody knows the next verse. Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful. You ever seen this verse? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Watch this. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. In other words, the word of God will divide between what you think is right, what you want to do, and what you feel you should do, and he'll, the word of God will tell you what God thinks is right, what God wants you to do, and what God feels you should do. But the word of God's the only thing that does it. The word of God, and remember it's like a sword. I just want you to remember the word sword, all right? And of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, and would you, if you, would you like to see the soul, the mind, will, and emotions? Watch. Of the thoughts, that's the mind, the intents, that's the will, of the heart, that's the emotions. The heart is the seat of the emotions, we're told. You know, I love you with all my heart. I feel this way in my heart. How do you feel in your heart about this? That's where your feelings are. That's where your emotions originate. Mind, will, and emotions right there in the Bible. Now, verse 13, most people have, no, have never even read it, or if they've read it, they read right over it. But it's the key. Verse 13, and, so the thought is continuing, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open, remember the word open, to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, I, I, I know that that didn't, I don't think that probably meant anything to you as to how that fits into verse 12. The word of God is like a sword that would divide between the soul and spirit. I'm going to tell you how it fits in. Okay, this word open, it's a great word. In, the, in English, again, we have a very limited language compared to Greek and Hebrew. And we don't have words to translate what they really should, the way they really should be translated many times. So the word open is a Greek word, and I don't want you guys, I've got a definition, but don't put the definition up yet. Let me just say the word first. Trachy lead soap. Now, many Greek words, you can figure out a little bit of what they're talking about because they sound like English words. Greek was translated to Latin and then Latin into English. For instance, the Greek word uh, cardia would be the heart, right? The Greek word logos, we, we call it, is the English word logic, logic. Uh, the Greek word graphe means graph, uh, suke, the Greek word is soul. I mean, there are so many, okay? Like even psychology, the study of the soul. Okay, so trachy lead so. So the first part is trachy. Anyone know what trachy is? It's your throat. It's your windpipe, right? So that's your throat, but it's your windpipe specifically. Trachy. Lead so is a little different. It's a military term. Remember, many, many Greek words are military or uh, athletic terms. Military or athletic. So it's a military term. Okay, you ready for this? I'm going to show you the exact Strong's exhaustive concordance definition of the tracheolitso, the word tracheolitso. You ready? Tracheolitso is to bend back the neck of a victim to be slain, to expose the gullet of a victim for killing. Can I tell you something? God has big plans for your soul. <laughs> That's what he would love to do with your unredeemed thoughts, your unredeemed desires, and your unredeemed feelings. He'd love to kill them and replace them with what he thinks about you, what he wants for your life, and how he feels about you. He would love to do that. He doesn't want to kill you. He wants to kill what's killing you. He doesn't want to kill you. He wants to kill what's killing you. Your soulish, selfish thoughts your soulish, selfish desires and your soulish, selfish feelings. He wants to kill them. 
And he would, think about this. He would love for you to think about yourself the way he thinks about you. He would love for you to know what he wants and desires for your life. And he would love for you to know how he feels about you rather than what the devil tells you that he feels about you. He would love for you to know that. So he wants to, he wants, so it, you came to church, here's some good news. God's trying to kill you. <laughs> He's trying to kill your old self. Hey, it's all through scripture. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified. I, I heard a pastor say one time, Christ went to the cross so you wouldn't have to. Well, that's not bad. It's not bad when you're talking about eternal salvation. But there's a scripture we need to reconcile with that. Here's Jesus talking. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus says to the disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Guess what? You have a cross too. <laughs> you have a cross too. And then Jesus goes further with this truth in Luke, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Why'd you have to say the word daily? Can I just do it once? Can I just walk down the aisle once and accept Jesus? Yes, and go to heaven. But if you want to live an overcoming life, you're going to have to crucify the flesh every day. You're going to have to come to the cross every day. And then Paul, Paul says it, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, I die daily. Does that mean he died every day? He got saved every day? The man got saved every day. I mean, he crucified himself every day. Okay, so it's the word. Stay in the word. Okay, but so one morning I was reading the word, normal practice for me, and I was a little uh, short on time, but I wanted, I've tried to read at least one chapter a day. I like to read where you read through the Bible in a year. So it's so many chapters in the new, so many in the old. And then sometimes you do Psalms and Proverbs more. But I'm, I, was, I was thought, well, gonna, I, I have a thing that I'm going to read at least one chapter a day. So, but, I had, but I was in a hurry, so I kind of read it quickly, okay? So I read the chapter, closed it, my laptop, started to leave, and the Lord said to me, hey, uh, what did you just read? <laughs> and I had this thing come to me. When our children were younger, sometimes they'd say, I want to go to big church. And I want to hear Daddy preach. But Debbie wisely would say afterward, um, what did Daddy preach on today? And they would say, uh, God. <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus. God and Jesus. So I'm sitting there and the Lord said to me, what did you just read? And then he reminded me of that, and he said, you want to say God and Jesus? Because <laughs> you don't have a clue what you just read, do you? I said, no. And the Lord said to me, son, now li listen to the whole statement, okay? He said, I'm not asking you to just read the word every day. I'm asking you to let the word read you. I actually want to speak to you. Now, you know, at, every, at the end of every message, I say something, and now pastors are actually using this all over the world. It's kind of cool, and maybe other pastors used to say it, but I'd never heard it. But at the every, end of every message, I say to you, after I say, by your close your eyes, I say, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message, right? Okay, when you read the Bible, I'm giving you another question. You should say, What's the Holy Spirit saying to me through this passage? And if you want to walk in victory, you're going to have to stop believing lies and you're going to have to stay in the Word. You're going to have to. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And now you can ask yourself that question. What's the Holy Spirit saying to me through this message? It's amazing to me how many people have bondages they can't get free from. But the key is getting in God's word every day. 
It's staying in the Word of God. And you're never going to have your spirit overcome your soul. God's thoughts overcome your thoughts. God's desires overcome your desires. And God's emotions, feelings overcome your feelings. Unless you get in the Word. And then it's going to start becoming natural for you. So we want to pray with you. If you're going through a difficulty right now at every campus, we want to pray with you. Any, any difficulty you're going through, we want to pray. And I, I, want, to, I want to, before we pray, um, I want you to just, I just noticed and uh, just look at me for a minute. I was noticing one of our apostolic elders.